Happy Thursday, Non-Obvious Nation. We are back for another edition of the Non-Obvious Insights Show. And wow, what a week we have had. Uh, one of the things that many people I've been talking to have been saying about this this past week is that it was just a chance to exhale. Like, whew. I mean, so many things have been happening, at least here in the US. And I know many of you are watching from other places around the world. But for my international friends in Australia and Singapore and India, I mean, this election over here has been all consuming for so many people. And I think this moment right now, like one of the things we've seen is just a chance to imagine forward what's going to happen. And so I'm so excited about the show today because not only are we going to talk about a couple of the non-obvious stories that really captured my attention this week, but I have an amazing guest who's joining me today, Safi Bakal, who is a author that I've been reading for a long time. He's a physicist and he just has a really, really fascinating perspective on the world. And so I can't wait for that conversation to happen. Um, and his book is Loon Shot. So we're going to get to that in just a few minutes. But first, let's talk about the non-obvious story of the week that was my absolute favorite, which was about a Kenyan journalist who decided that he was going to cover the US election the same way that American journalists tend to cover stories about Africa. And the way he wrote a series of tweets, and there's these kind of multiple tweets that I wanna kind of put up here as you can read them while I'm talking about this, was just so perspective shifting because it, it spotlighted a type of bias in the global media that just usually we don't pay attention to, we just don't notice in the way that these stories are covered. And so this was one of those things where once I started reading some of these tweets and I saw uh, each each new one, and let me put up the next one, uh, next one here. I mean, it was just so well done. And I was really, really, uh, uh, cap it just really captured me. And so if you get my email every week, Definitely click on the link and read the full series of tweets or uh, the journalist Twitter name is up here. Uh, you can just follow that and check it out. I highly, highly recommend it. I mean, there are some fantastic uh, tweets that are just, just really interesting. So that was the story that captured my attention the most this week because it just helped me to shift my perspective a little bit. Another story, though, that, that I thought was interesting and, and not election related at all, which is great because now we can kind of move past some of those things and, and, and evolve into other stories, was Peloton doing a partnership with Beyonce to have her or maybe her people uh, curate classes, workout classes with music. And this was on the heels of Peloton kind of getting in trouble for using music without paying the proper licensing fees. And so their solution to that, instead of just blanket paying for licensing fees across the board to use all types of music, was to do a deep dive partnership with a influencer, with somebody who's a musician, to curate some of those things. And it just got me thinking about the potential for what we will likely see in the next year and, and, and forward around these partnerships where the people who have built these personalities and built these followings of people who just follow everything that they do are going to be the curators. They're going to be the ones who say, look, here's what you should listen to when you're working out. Here's what you should listen to when you're cooking. Here's what you should listen to when you're uh, when you're driving. And the opportunity that that would allow for so many organizations to work with so many influencers on various levels is just like a huge, huge opportunity. And so this was one of those examples, obviously on a huge scale. I mean, it's a big brand Peloton and, and probably the biggest, arguably the biggest movie star, I mean, a music star, but, it's an idea that I think many organizations can use. And so this is one of those marketing concepts that I think is definitely, definitely worth thinking about. Another big story this week was about a perfume launched by Powell's Books, which is one of my favorite bookstores in Portland, Oregon. And the perfume smells like books, which immediately for me as an author and a publisher is just like, it just captures my attention. I mean, I love the smell of, of books. It's great. And the story behind this is great, but it was one of many stories I've been seeing over the last several months around this idea of taking the scent of something and using it to offer an experience to people. So there's another one that was a perfume that smells like outer space. I don't know what outer space smells like, but I definitely went on that Kickstarter and like funded that one because I like I want to know. And every couple of weeks, my son asked me like, hey, did the outer space perfume come yet? So like maybe we won't get onto Elon Musk's trip to Mars, but at least we can smell what outer space smells like. 
But what was, interest, what was most interesting for me about all of these different scents is I used to think of perfume and the entire category of perfume as I'm going to use a certain perfume to smell better when I meet other people. It was like more about the other people as opposed to yourself. And now there's this whole category, it seems, of perfume that's like, look, you love the smell of books, so like smell like books. You love the smell of outer space, or at least you're curious about the smell of outer space, so smell like that. And there was another uh, story that related to this about how the smell of sandalwood apparently might help to regrow hair. That was one of those scientific studies that, that came out. So like now I definitely need to get that because, you know, getting a little thin up there. So that would be an awesome thing to have. But anyway, that just captured my attention as well. It was just that interesting uh, piece. So as a quick reminder, before we get to our amazing guest this week, if you don't yet get my email every Thursday morning, uh, morning for us here in the US, but probably afternoon or evening for some of my friends who are in Asia or, or in Europe. Uh, definitely subscribe to that here. Uh, you can also, if you're watching on YouTube, there's a little button in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, and you can just click that to subscribe to get notifications about all of our next shows coming up. So now it is time for me to welcome my uh, brand new friend, but I have been a longtime reader and, and admirer of his work, uh, Safi Bakal. So uh, Safi, welcome to the Non-Obvious Insights Show. Been an admirer and a fan of your non-obvious stuff uh, for a long time. And I just have to say, a perfume that smells like outer space or books, I don't think I could define Loonshot any better. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a great place to start, I think, because your wonderful book is titled Loon Shots. And you actually, the, one of the first things you do is you talk about the difference between a moonshot and a loon shot. So tell us about the difference, how you define those two things. Well, everybody knows what a moonshot is. It's a big goal that you, you get really excited about. And it came from uh, when John F. Kennedy in 1962 said, we'll put a man on the end of the moon by, uh, oh, put a man on the moon by the end of this decade. It was this big goal everybody got very excited about. But what most people don't realize is that the way we got there had to do with an idea that was suggested 40 years earlier by a man named Robert Goddard, who suggested liquid fuel jet propulsion, putting a bunch of gases in a metal tube and blowing them up. And at the time, his idea was wildly dismissed and written off as crazy. You know, the New York Times says, this person doesn't even understand the basic laws of physics that we teach our children in high school. You know, in space, there's nothing to push against. So obviously a rocket can't fly, <laughs> duh. That's what they said in the 1920s. And actually what's very funny is that uh, uh, in July, 1959, the day after the successful, uh, uh, 69, the day after the successful rocket launch to the moon, the Times issued a retraction. Uh, apparently rocket flight does not violate 17th century physics and quote, <laughs> the Times regrets the error. So a moonshot is a destination but nurturing loon shots, those wild, crazy ideas that everybody thinks are nuts, is how we get there. Yeah, and, and you are, uh, it strikes me that, I mean, you're a physicist by training. And one of the, the totally relatable parts of your book is when you talk about having been in the world of academia, your parents are, are scientists and academics, and then you decided to kind of cross over into business. And, and they had that, that uh, the five stages of denial you talk about, or the five stages of grief, I guess they are, one of which is denial. And, and and it was interesting to me because what you started to do is make this connection between these scientific principles and what are uh, maybe more romantic notions in business. And perhaps the, the most romantic one that you uh, break down quite well, I have to say, is the idea of culture and how uh, in, in enamored we are in the business world in talking about culture, and instead of focusing on culture, you say it's actually more about structure. So talk about the difference between those and maybe why you've seen business people get so romantic about culture when actually maybe they should be focused on something else. Well, it's an easy thing to say. When, when uh, a journalist interviews a CEO, oh my God, your company's doing fantastic. How did you get there? Well, it's really about culture. It's an easy thing for a CEO to say because it sort of ends the conversation and uh, the journalist can print it, and on the CEO is giving away nothing. Because anyone who's actually been in that position knows that there's a lot more to it. But by saying that, it satisfies the media, they print, they print these nice stories, it seems like magic that no one else can reproduce. 
But what's missing from that fact is that so often people give the exact same answers about culture, our culture got us here, and then you read in the same magazine two weeks later how the company completely tank. So it really doesn't have very much to do about culture. And the example I often use, I fortunately have a prop with me, is this glass of water. When I stick my finger in and swirl it around, the molecules just slosh around my finger, and that's always true for any liquid. But as soon as I lower the temperature right at 32 Fahrenheit, those molecules suddenly change behavior. Why? They're exactly the same molecules inside. So why do they suddenly change behavior? And this is what I mean about culture versus structure. You can think of culture as the patterns of behavior that you see. The molecules are sloshing around or they're totally rigid. And you can think of structure as what's underneath those small things that drive those patterns of behavior. In the case of that glass of water, it's temperature. And that's what's really going on inside a company when wildly innovative companies suddenly start to change, when they grow big and start to ossify. It has nothing to do with the CEO pounding the table. It's exactly the same people inside, right? If you imagine you have a block of ice, no amount of yelling at the molecules in the block of ice, hey guys, could you just loosen up a little bit? It's gonna change that pattern of behavior. It's gonna melt that ice. But a small change in temperature will get the job done. So that's what yeah, I talk it, about is how those small changes in temperature are like structure inside companies. And you have, I mean, the, the analogy with the glass of water has, has certainly gone viral for you. I mean, you have a very popular TED talk where you use that analogy to kind of explain. I, I think one of the things that that maybe we uh, we think too much about, which is the person instead of the system. And you talk about the system mindset and like think about what's what do we need to shift in the system in order to make a change in the way we think or the way that people think? And it strikes me that right now, coming out of a, uh, a very divisive election and, and, and living in a culture that feels very disconnected, how could we use that system mindset to maybe stop focusing on the people and start focusing on like what is allowing this division to happen? Exactly. If you say, well, this person is a bad guy or this person is a good guy or, you know, this person is doing the right things. It's like that. It's like the CEO pounding the table and telling everybody just innovate, innovate, innovate or yelling at the, you know, at, at, the, gla at, the, at, the, at the block of ice. Guys, just loosen up a little bit. Can you molecules just shake around a little bit? You're missing the point. There's something structural in our system. And so what we want to ask is what changed? What changed in the last 20 years and even in the last 10 years that has caused our nation to polarize? What is a small change that has happened that has really and, tipped the balance? And what, what do you think's changed? I mean, you know, you're an observer of, of what's been happening here. Uh, you're sort of living in the same culture that, that I am. I mean, how would you describe what's changed? The Facebook like button. And okay, the Twitter retreat yeah. fe feature. Actually, there's a bunch of uh, scientists who've done some very uh, researches in social science who have done some interesting studies, but you can see the polarization inflection point really take off. And I'll explain what I mean by that. In organizations and groups, it has to do with another project I'm working on now about why markets crash. But the bottom line is when the coupling between things in a system is fairly weak, people act fairly independently you don't get big bubbles or big crashes. If everybody, for example, was making investment decisions on their own, you would never have bubbles and crashes. It's when there's a lot of talk and a lot of close co coordination when people start to imitate each other. That's when you get huge bubbles and crashes in markets, but that's when you get huge bubbles and crashes in society. Why markets crash is- Yeah, I mean, you- um... Yeah, and you, I mean, I think I remember reading in the book, you describe it as a difference between the wisdom of crowds versus the tyranny of crowds. And right. it, it strikes me that uh, there are many examples of, of the tyranny of crowds. I mean, you think about Wikipedia and just the rise of that and how there's all these stories about people who just, they can't even get their own birthday corrected um, on Wikipedia because the Wikipedia uh, monitors or whatever they're called, the editors or, you know, whatever they're technical term is say look you're not allowed to edit that entry because you're not a certified wikipedia guy um so how do we get get like past that that uh, idea that oh the more consumer generated stuff we have the better which obviously doesn't turn out to be the case a lot of times no where you watch out for where bubbles and crashes can be uh 
very dangerous for the society. So for example, with social media, the Facebook like button or the Twitter retweet feature, feature exacerbated the, the coupling, the interactions between people in the system so that it made bubbles and crashes enormously easier. Now, the scary thing about that is we're not going back. Social media, we're not going back to no social media like we had 20 years ago or no Facebook like button or no Twitter retreat feature. What it means is that we live in a new world where the interactions are much stronger. We don't have the filter of everything goes up into three news anchors, ABC, CBS, and NBC, and then comes down uh, or New York Times and Wall Street Journal. That feature is with us to stay. So it means that we need new kinds of laws and new kinds of regulations to understand this. And I think a lot of uh, people in the political leadership as well as uh, the, the tech industry leadership have only just begun to wrap their minds around that in the last five or 10 years where we realize this is a different world and we need to regulate it in a different way because there is harm. You know, it took many years for yeah. the US to develop the FDA to realize that, hey, just letting companies give medicines to anybody they want sounds good, but in practice, there's a harm to that. This is exactly yeah, we don't some. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, we don't appreciate sometimes the scale of time that it took to get to the the way of understanding the systems that something like the FDA has now become versus how early a lot of these social media uh, platforms are. You know, I want to take a moment and just turn to some of the online comments because we're getting a, a bunch of uh, a bunch of them coming in, and I think we might have a question in here. Um, so uh, a question from Jennifer here, and, and thanks for watching, uh, by the way, Jennifer. How can you get people to stop leading their life through feelings? Because feelings change, and if you don't control your feelings, life is negatively impacted. So yeah, that's an interesting interesting point. How would you you know, respond to that? Well, I think there's a, there's a, a trap of trying to suppress your feelings. I think there's a common sort of pervasive myth. My friend Sue David writes quite a bit about that of saying, you got to just be happy, you got to be positive, you know, bad feelings are bad and you shouldn't have them. And I think that's a mistake. You got to recognize that your feelings are there for a reason. It's a certain part of your brain, a subconscious part, unconscious part, trying to recognize something environment and tell you something important about your environment, something you need to do or think about. So you first want to step back and observe those feelings and then ask, why is that feeling there? What is that feeling trying to do for me? Is it trying to warn me about something? Is it trying to educate me? How is that feeling trying to help me get to my goals? So you work with your feelings rather than against your feelings. Yeah, and you are, one of the things I love about you and I love about your book, and by the way, I just have to show you this. So, uh, you know, obviously I have your book here, but I, what I didn't show you is this is the side of it. And like, this is this is all of the stuff that I had saved in my little tabs with my typical way of writing, uh, of reading a book that I just found fascinating because there's so many great stories in here. And, and I want to, I want you to maybe share the story of one of the chapters, which is, is uh, one of my favorite parts of the book where you talk about why the world speaks English. And I wonder if you could just share in a shortened version, cause you know, we gotta <laughs> keep the show rolling um, uh, of that story, because I think it's so fascinating. Well, what's often, can, so I'll do about 2,000 years of history in about 90 seconds. Is that is that what you're asking, Ron? You did 3,000 years of physics in, uh, in what was it, 45 I, minutes or something I like that? So. I used to do that. That was true. <laughs> no, the, it is a, when you, uh, in fact, it, one of the ways I got started in writing this book was I was just so puzzled by this question. I used to give this sort of fun talk of 3,000 years of the history of science in a, you know 40 minutes or so. But I always got stuck with this first question, which is, why did modern science and the scientific method, you know, the ideas that there are laws of nature uh, and we can identify those laws of nature through experiments, that idea was a radical idea. It was in some ways, as I wrote about, kind of the loon shot of all time. It was the idea that changed the course of our species more than any other idea. But why did it start in this, what was essentially a backwater of history. And especially if you read a lot of Western civilization history, you miss the fact that for about a thousand years, uh, England, Western Europe was completely irrelevant. China and India absolutely dominated world GDP. There were 50% of the world GDP of the economy, of trade, uh, of advancements in science and mining and agriculture and irrigation and technology, uh, paper, printing, uh, currency, 
uh, use of magnets, many types of clocks, all were invented in China, the kind of mathematics that we use. Much of that comes from India and the Islamic um, empire, all of which predates 17th, 18th century Western Europe, which is where most Western history textbook starts. So why Western Europe? What happened? Why did China and India and the Islamic empire, which were far, far larger and much more dominant and much more advanced on science and technology, why did they lose? And why did these teeny, teeny little countries in Western Europe, England had like half a percent of world GDP. It was nothing. Yeah. And that is kind of what started me in the journey, weirdly enough, to write this Loonshots book because it was so similar to questions you see in the business world that I now spend a lot of my time on working with CEOs and leadership On teams. a much condensed scale, right? Right. <laughs> not, why not thousands did, of years. It's like, you know, why did, uh, why did one succeed and why one didn't? Why did so many, you know, IBM was this dominant, it was, the, it was the China, the India, the Islamic empire of the IT industry for 70 years, just like yeah. China was the ruler of the world for millennium. What happened to IBM? Why did it go? Um, in and, what, and what did happen? I mean, you know, what's the, <laughs> is there a, a well, condensed same, version of what happened? The same thing that happened it, It's it, in um, China, uh, India, and the Islamic empire and why Western Europe got to succeed, which is that when you have these dominant empires, when, despite the fact that everybody has great intentions, it goes back to that glass of water. It's exactly the same people inside and they want to win just like any entrepreneur. Do you think the ruler of China said, you know what I'd really like to do is lose my empire? Do you think that the CEO of IBM said, you know what would be awesome is if we went from you know the number one co company in the world to completely down here? Absolutely not. But what happens is when you create that organization, what people miss is that good teams will kill great ideas. And why that happens is kind of what I write about, why that glass of water will mm -hmm. suddenly change from liquid to solid, despite the best efforts of any, you know, any CEO or empire or emperor. Yeah, and one of the um, one of the things that you do talk about, which is a very practical idea, but it struck me as, as non-obvious <laughs> um, when I read it, was the difference between the individuals within an organization that you call artists versus soldiers. And one of the specific things you talk about is you have to keep them separate, which kind of flies in the face of all of this, like break down your silos, make sure you have collaboration, like get collaboration tools. We should all be able to like know instantly on Slack when somebody even steps away from their desk for four minutes, right? Like that's the, that's the, the sentiment right now. And, and, and it struck me that you're kind of advocating these people need to be separate from one another. So like talk about that and the importance of that and why we don't typically think that way anymore, or maybe we never did. Absolutely. And the, uh, and in fact, that's what in the end helped Western Europe is that all these crazy ideas were able to develop separately without being crushed by the weight of an empire or an emperor, which is mm -hmm. what, by the way, in China and in India, all of the same ideas came up and they ended up being crushed. They came up hundreds of years earlier than they did in Western Europe. By they, some leader who didn't believe it or leader. didn't fund it or didn't promote it. Exactly. And the difference mm -hmm. with Western Europe is what you yeah. said over here. It was so fragmented, all these crazy little ideas, even though occasionally people tried to crush them, they would just appear somewhere else. So how, that is a non-obvious idea. I have you know, a whole list of non-obvious ideas about how to nurture <laughs> crazy ideas. But one of them I think of as the beautiful baby problem. It's, it's exactly what you what you mentioned, you want to create, whether it's separate in by role or separate in time, you want to create separate structures, separate homes for your crazy ideas and for delivering on, and, the, and the people who are focused on delivering on time, on budget, on spec. Why? They have two different jobs. One you're asking to take risk, one you're asking to minimize risk. You can't go to the whole company and say, take risk, minimize risk, take risk, reduce risk, take risk, reduce risk. You just get slush. You get neither solid nor liquid. You get yeah. nothing. So the I call it the beautiful baby problem because the non-obvious idea here is you have that conflict and you want to lean into that conflict. And here's what I mean by the conflict. The artist, the creative working on the new, whether it's the biologist in the lab who's got a new idea for a cancer drug or the engineer who's came up with this awesome algorithm that no one's done before, sees their ideas as wonderful, beautiful baby full of potential. 
The soldier who's focused on on time, on budget, on spec consistently to customers sees a shriveled up raisin covered in vomit and poop. And that's the core of the problem. Beautiful baby, vomit and poop. And here's the non-obvious idea. You want that conflict. So many CEOs and leadership teams are like, well, can we all just sing Kumbaya and hold hands and we're all in this together? Could you be more like A and could B be more like, you know, could A be more like B and B be more like A? That's exactly the wrong thing to do. You want those artists to be wild and crazy and seeing the beautiful babies. And you want the soldiers to see the vomit and poop, all the reasons it might go wrong, all the flaws and how to mitigate them. Your job as a leader or manager is to bridge that divide, not to erase so it, but to bridge it. So when you uh, get in front of a leader, a CEO, somebody who is in a position of power and you tell them that, which sounds like the right thing to do, do they do it? I mean, do they act on it? Like what, what is, does it take a major mental shift and, and are they able to do it uh, and, and, and actually implement it? I'm, I'm curious about that. Yeah. Well, it, Firstly, you know, what we're talking about is sort of tip of the iceberg, and there's much more underneath the surface about the structures and the processes, things that sound kind of boring to an entrepreneur. And by the way, here's another non-obvious idea. The worst person to advise large companies uh, on how to innovate faster or better are entrepreneurs, because they not only do they not understand or care for <laughs> all of the levers that you need to work inside a, a large company to make ideas happen, they don't respect it. And when you don't respect yeah. it, you can't influence it. You can't work with it. So you've got to understand both. Just being, by the way, an entrepreneur is a certain skill set. It's the, it's not the right skill set. It's often the opposite skill set of what works inside a big company, right. championing idea inside a big company. So yes, the, the answer is when I work with CEOs or leadership teams, and and some is on the private sector, and some we can talk about if we have time. Uh, military and national security organizations, because there's a lot of non-obvious stuff that's happening there. And uh, I've gotten some pretty amazing calls. The CIA is looking for you, uh, working with leadership teams uh, in the military. Wait, I, I, you um, you had a pause at exactly the right mo wrong moment there, and what I heard was the CIA is looking for you. And then you <laughs> went to the last second part, which was probably not a good place to <laughs> to leave that one. So I'm glad they're not just looking for you, which is you know probably problematic on multiple levels. But I love the idea that you share of being able to. Uh, to have those ideas survive without bringing in this heavy hammer and, and the notion that that entrepreneurs can understand what that really means and the all of the things that that big businesses are doing to try and bring those entrepreneurs in whether it's the hackathons or the co-working spaces or like the innovation labs man we love these innovation labs now like it's that's what it's all about right and and a lot of times it does fail because you're right they the, they don't understand how it works and and i have a unique lens on that for for a long time because i've been in the big company world and then i only became an entrepreneur when i turned 40. so for me it was like relatively later in life i wasn't the kid selling lemonade stand you know from the stand that wasn't me and so i think that that to some degree it's like unlearning some of the things that you have have been doing and and i wonder we do need to kind of close out the conversation unfortunately but i wonder if you could talk about uh, the impact of the background that you're bringing into the world of business and organizations from having been a scientist, having grown up in a household where both of your parents uh, were scientists also, and, and, and whether that's giving you a way of thinking that that is vastly different from what you see in people who've been entrepreneurs their whole lives or trained in business their whole lives and don't have that mentality. Yeah, no, I think the it is an advantage when you're talking to CEOs. A lot. I, I ran a public company, and so when I sit across the table from folks who are running public companies, firstly, there's this sort of a mind meld. I know how much of the stuff you read in media, or journalism, or pop business books uh, is just stuff you know you you tend to ignore if you're in in one of those leadership positions, um, and what actually matters. But I think one of the things that it does have a, uh, an impact is that you're introducing a new kind of science. You're explaining what are the things in structure that you can change and why. And here's evidence that you could really sink your teeth into that it works and it makes a difference. And no one's ever talked about organizations in quite that way using an equation uh, derived you know, from physics principles that actually make sense. And since I managed a company for quite a long time, for 14 years, I had a head of HR 
So if I gave him something that really was kind of silly, he would just immediately tell me I was full of full of something and I needed to translate it into regular human language. So that that's one thing that makes a big difference. The power that I'm the ability to draw across industries when I meet with the folks in the intelligence community or, or military and I can draw on my experiences. So let's say Microsoft or Google or Amazon. Uh, and then I can draw on experiences inside small companies and then connect those in a way that makes sense to as, you know, leadership teams. I think that combination is what has helped make a difference. That's that's amazing. I, I have one last thing I wanted to ask you about. We do have a couple of like questions and comments um, coming in. So uh, I do want to try and get to this, but we're getting right at the end of the show. So maybe we can find a quick way of, of doing that. But I wanted to get you to talk about a term. One of the things I liked at the end of your book is that you have an appendix. And among the list of terms, there are several terms that uh, were introduced as part of the book. And one of the terms that you talk about is the false fail. And I wonder if you could define that for us and just talk about why that's important to spot. Well, I'll do it as an example, one that I, I gave in the book, which is when uh, Mark Zuckerberg was going around with the idea with the new kind of social network, almost every investor passed because you had uh, all these social networks fail, including at the time, uh, Friendster, which had grown up and then was starting to tank as everybody was leaving. And that, it turns out, was a perfect example of a false fail. As a guy named Peter Thiel quickly realized, Friendster wasn't failing because social networks were bad business models and everybody left them because they were just kind of a fad. It failed because they had a software glitch. And he realized that people made drew the wrong conclusion from that failure. It was a failure in the experiment, not in the underlying idea. And so he wrote a check for $500,000, which he sold eight years later for a billion. But a false fail is when the experiment that is designed to test the idea is flawed, not the underlying idea. And you want to look carefully for that. That's great. I I, I think we could go on for a, a very long time. I know you have amazing non-obvious insights. For anyone who has not yet picked up your book, I know that there's now a paperback version of the book as well. Uh, it's done extremely well. It's been a Wall Street Journal bestseller. It's been recommended by I don't know, Bill Gates, uh, Malcolm Gladwell. I mean, you could <laughs> run a list of all the people who who love this book and, and for good reason. So, uh, Safi, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us on the Non-Obvious Insights show uh, today. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me, Rod. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. And uh, just as a reminder for everybody watching, uh, we every week interview a new fascinating person about non-obvious ideas. Uh, if you like the stories that we talked about today and you're enjoying the show, please do subscribe on YouTube. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube right now, just click the button in the corner and you can easily subscribe to get a notification of every new show we've got. And I just want to say thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being part of the conversation and always stay non-obvious. <laughs>